This 10th year of Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you listening to me right now. Maybe you're Mike Akins or Norm Fazekas or Chris Allen, or maybe you're a new patron. Hey, everybody, welcome in Bruno, Adrian, and Dewey. On this episode of DTNS, Apple's going all in on AI, the PlayStation Portal, not as bad as you think, and get the right note-taking app for the right note-taking job. Right note-taking here. This is the Daily Tech News for Monday, November 13th, Monday the 13th, 2023. In Los Angeles, I'm Tom Merritt. And I'm Allison Sherrod into the Podfeet Podcast. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. You're right note-taking here, Allison. I am. And you're going to tell us about all the note-taking apps. You use a lot of them, actually. I do. Use them all. <laughs> yeah. And you're generous enough to share that knowledge with us. Thank you for that. Let us start with the quick hits. Google has filed what it is believed to be the first lawsuit meant to protect users of a big tech company's AI product. Google filled the law, filed rather, and they, I'm sure they filled it with a lot of stuff. They filed the lawsuit in California against three unknown individuals believed to be in Vietnam who have been placing Facebook ads claiming to offer a download of Google's Bard, but which actually delivers malware. In addition, other to the deception involved there, they also use Google trademarks and other intellectual property. Google has been submitting takedown requests, of course, uh, so they're not mad at Facebook about this, but they are filing the lawsuit in order to go after the domain names to stop them from using them with U.S. registrars and shut down the ones they have. NVIDIA announced plans to offer the Grace Hopper-based HGX H200 GPU. This is an updated version of the standalone H100 accelerator with HBM3E memory. Great for generative models. NVIDIA says that GH200 will be used in more than 40 AI supercomputers worldwide. Probably the biggest install will be in Jupiter, a supercomputer being built in Germany that will use 24,000 NVIDIA GH200 superchips interconnected with the NVIDIA Quantum 2 InfiniBand networking platform. That's a lot. Jupiter will be used for climate modeling, drug discovery, and more. That is. That's a big old... It, it earned its name of Jupiter. It's, it's huge. I don't know if it's cloudy, though. The biggest e-commerce sales event of the year is not Black Friday. You thought I was going to say is coming soon. Uh, no. Singles Day, which just happened last weekend on November 11th. Well, centered around November 11th. Just like Black Friday has expanded, Singles Day has expanded as well. Uh, Alibaba and JD.com both reported growth, although for the second year running, they didn't report numbers, just said things grew. Data analyst Sintun estimated that sales across major e-commerce platforms rose 2.08% slightly slower than last year's growth of 2.9%. Total sales revenue for Singles Day estimated at $154.6 billion. And as a comparison, last year's Black Friday spending was estimated by Adobe to be $9.12 billion. So Singles Day, um, that definitely is bigger. Bananas. That yeah. is bananas. Wow. Well, Google has had an, an option to save any video frame from YouTube video. In Microsoft Edge or Google Chrome, you can right-click on a YouTube video and save the frame in its original resolution as a PNG. It's an easy screenshot, basically. The feature is based on capabilities added to the Chromium engine. Now, I would, uh, I would imagine it would work with other Chromium browsers, like Arc, maybe? Yeah, probably. Uh, I don't know if there's any special browser stuff going on uh, as well. They did only mention Edge and Chrome. Um, but yeah, I, I I think it could work in the others if it doesn't yet. But it's probably not going to make its way to Safari or Firefox, unfortunately. Right. Uh, and I don't know if you ran into that uh, discussion last week about the annoying pop-up we talked about that shows up when you close OneDrive, where Microsoft requires you to tell them why you're closing OneDrive. Uh, well, it's gone. Microsoft says it was just a test. Only a subset of users saw it, and it has now concluded its test and disabled it for everyone. Thank you. I That's hate it when software gets needy. Yeah. I I understand, like, maybe sometimes telling, asking people, like, hey, do you mind? We're, we're just curious. We're trying to do user data. That's perfectly legitimate. But this thing was doing it every time for users, apparently. So not good. 
Well, as if in honor of the host of one of the longest running Apple oriented podcasts in the world coming on our show, both Bloomberg's Mark Gurman and analyst Ming Chi Kuo released some of their usually reliable indications of what Apple will be doing soon. So, Allison, I'm going to run through them and see what you think. You ready? Okay. Uh, the first one's the big one Apple execs apparently think that updates to the next round of operating systems, so iOS 18, Mac OS 15, Watch OS 11, TV OS 18, all the ones coming next year will be ambitious and compelling in their use of AI. Now, granted, I'm sure if you ask any Apple exec about any upcoming OS, they're always going to say, we believe it's ambitious and compelling. <laughs> but I think what German's trying to get across here is they're very excited. They're more excited than usual about this one. And supposedly it's going to feature a lot of generative AI. German says, for example, Siri is going to be able to field complex questions, autocomplete sentences more effectively for you, things like that. Uh, there's also mention of integrating these kind of models into Apple Music, say to create a playlist for you, or Pages or Keynote to consist you uh, to assist you in your presentations. Uh, Allison, how excited does this prediction get you? Well, one of the things that Apple does pretty regularly is every other update lately has been you know the major updates. It's been big feature updates, then a lot of bug fixes make it work better, cleaner, a little bitty updates, and the big updates back and forth. So it does make sense that it would be bigger updates, but this does make me even more excited if they're digging into generative AI and going to have that, of course, be, I'm sure, on board on devices. And, uh, you know, as an Apple user, that's one of the things I appreciate. I'm not sure I would have chosen it completely on that basis, but to be able to have things uh, locally. And I'm guessing they're probably going to dance on the legaler side of, you know, the less dicey gray side of uh, where they train the data as well. So maybe that'll make people people happy. Um, I would think that would be really fun to see more of that. And uh, the, just a smarter, smart assistant. I, I always come back to something Leo Laporte said, where he said, if this is a smart assistant, this would be the worst assistant you ever had, you know, <laughs> any of these. You know, where you yeah. say, um, am I busy at 10 o'clock? And she says, no. And you say, OK, can you make me an appointment at that time? And she says, when? <laughs> Imagine if you had a real life assistant who talked to you like that. Yeah, like, yeah. And they've slowly been getting better at context and things like that. Uh, but slowly yeah. is the operative word, right? So yeah. I think you're right. German does say that Apple is trying to decide how much of this would be in the cloud, how much on device, whether they'd go all one way or all the other. Uh, if Apple wants to keep promoting itself as privacy preserving, the more on the device, the better. Uh, sounds like maybe there's a couple of things they think only work well in the cloud that they'll want to give you a carve out and a justification for why in these cases we're going to send it to the cloud. I'll be curious to see about that. Um, you don't suppose they would do that by device, do you? Like if you've got the iPhone 16, you could do it locally, but if you've got like right. an iPhone 12, no, you're going to have to use the cloud because yeah. you just don't have the compute power. But that would be very confusing to users if they did that. I, I would almost imagine they would do it by device on platform. Like iPhones can do it on device unless you have too old of an iPhone, then it just doesn't work at all, right? Because that right. makes sense to people. People understand, oh, my phone is old. That's why it doesn't get the new thing. Um, but maybe tvOS has to go to the cloud, right? Oh, because yeah, that yeah, processor right, right. is smaller or something, or you know, obviously your Apple Watch, something like that. But then um, Mac OS maybe can always do it locally. Yeah, because it's got the best processors it's got a GPU uh, of the whatever. whole bunch, yeah. yeah. I. I, I I know a lot. In fact, I think it was Nick with a C was like, oh, save us from the AI bubble. Uh, I doubt Apple will come with something that is fluff. I, th I think if they're going to tell us about a large language model, uh, they will tell us about it in a way that doesn't use the word AI. They go right. listen to their keynotes. They almost never say the word AI. They talk about models. They talk about features. So I would expect them to come out and say, in the next operating system, Siri is going to be smarter and she'll understand what you're talking about or he'll understand what you're talking about uh, and stuff like that. So I'm, I'm, I'm curious what these ambitious and compelling features are going to be. Not only do they not even say AI, and they, a lot of times they don't even say features. They yeah. describe the life experience that right. you'll have, right? Good, Without yes, saying, exactly. you know, you'll be able to communicate. You know? It's like you're just having a conversation with Siri. 
Uh, also, a couple other things here. German says Apple will allow sideloading of apps in the EU sometime in the first half of 2024. Uh, this is more a prediction about when it will happen. It's going to happen. It has to happen because of the um, uh, the the EU law, uh, the Direct Markets Act, will require Apple to allow sideloading. How it's going to happen will be very interesting. Uh, German has mentioned that there there could be a fee involved for app developers to get on the side loading verification list, Apple might be able to do something where they say, well, we're not, we're not going to allow just anything on for security reasons, but we will allow side loading for a very small uh, fee. If developers run through our verification program, which would be a way of recouping some of the money they would lose from the app store. What do you think of this? Well, just to clarify what we're talking about here is this is on iOS and iPad OS, obviously on Mac OS, you can already side load anything you want. Sure. Um, I'm trying to remember, have we broken away from where Apple said, sure, you can sideload apps, but then you still have to pay us 27%? That's not sideloading. And that's a that's a really good uh that's a really good question. Sideloading is I can go straight to a website, right. say, give me that app so and it's never it through the app store. Yeah. Okay. What a- Apple has allowed in in some cases is a third party app store, right? Or a third party payment processor, even better. Um, I, in fact, I don't even think they've allowed a third-party app store, but they have allowed a third-party payment processor. So you're still in the app store in those cases, but your payments could go through somewhere else. And that's where Apple says, well, we're going to take a lower cut. Okay. Okay. But they, I don't think anywhere they let you go directly to any website right. and download an app and install it. Right. You can now do web apps pretty easily, but that's a different thing. Right. And that can, that makes it confusing too. I'm glad you brought that up because some people are like, well, I've done Fortnite that way, or I I've done the financial times app that way. And it's like, no, you really haven't. You've done a web app and Apple does allow those oddly enough without any kind of verification or anything else. Right? When they would love you to just take that as the answer. They, yeah. they, they've tried that a bunch of time going, you can make web apps. Go ahead. Yeah. It's fine developers don't love that solution. It, right. it works, but it's not the smoothest solution. Uh, all right. Those are the two Mark Gurman ones. The Ming-Chi Kuo uh, announcement is probably the safest bet. Apple's going to have new iPads. Next what? Year. <laughs> yeah, I know. Right. <laughs> Stepping uh, out on a limb. But, but, but specifically he said there will be a 12.9 inch iPad air at the beginning of the oh. year and that the iPad pro will get OLED screens and an M3 processor in Q2. There are a lot of other things in there that you'd expect, but those are the standouts. Anything they do to simplify the lineup is what I would ask them to do. Like, don't even give mm-hmm. us new ones. Just make it where you can tell what this iPad does and how to use it. Yeah, I this created does the a diagram, opposite, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah I, I created a diagram last week that was just trying to show you which pencils and which authentication message or method work on which of the iPads. And it was phenomenally complex. It took me like three days to draw the diagram. Yeah. And Howard's like, didn't they do that a year ago? They, they did a 12.9 inch iPad Pro. This would be a 12.9 inch iPad Air. And what makes it an Air? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think that I, I, one of the reasons I like to talk about what Mark Gurman and Ming Chi Kuo say is that they tend to relate to what's actually happening. Uh, when they are wrong, it's often because Apple changed what it was going to do, not because they were wrong when they, when they found out the information. But I was wondering if we should, we should start like a, a Google Doc where we keep track of these. And just, you know, hold hold to account. Like, all right, how good are they? Well, then we'd have to do like a sliding scale, maybe the way you do it when you do your year-end predictions of what does ambitious and compelling mean, right? Yeah, what qualifies. Yeah, do they get a one, two, or a three on that one? (laughs) Yeah, no, I like it. Um, If you you think we should do that, send us an email, feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Maybe we'll put something together. Sony's PlayStation Portal launches on Wednesday, November 15th for $199.95, 200 bucks. It streams games using Wi-Fi off your home PlayStation 5. So it doesn't do anything on its own. It has to have a Wi-Fi connection and your PlayStation 5 has to be on, connected to Wi-Fi as well. And well, I guess it could be Ethernet, but it also has to be logged in. Uh, It doesn't do any cloud streaming. It doesn't run anything locally on the device. The reviews of the portal are in, and the pros seem to be that it feels better than it looks. 
because it looks like someone chopped a controller in half and glued it to the sides of an LCD screen. Uh, but The Verge's Antonio Di Benedetto likens it to an eight inch LCD between two halves of a standard dual sense controller is basically what I just said, uh, but said it plays well. That, that, it, that it works. You kind of forget that it looks so odd. The cons from a lot of these reviewers are that it doesn't do anything than remote play your existing PS5. So you need a PS5 if you want to use this. You're not going to buy this on its own. And basically the general impression seems to be it's pretty good at what it does. It's a little expensive for what it does. But if it's something you want, uh, well, it does it, uh, you know, and it, it's not a disappointment at that. I think people came in with low expectations and were surprised to find it like worked well. Uh, Roger, I know you were looking at a lot of these reviews. What, what did you make of them? So in my in my view, it seems a bit of an odd product, uh, mostly because of what you listed. It is essentially a second screen for the PS5. It's not a cloud gaming device. Um, it's not really intended, or at least Sony hasn't uh, 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 explicitly said that it's you know you can take it to your aunt's house and you can play over the Wi-Fi and connect to your PS5 remotely, which you can do. But uh, some of the ex uh, some of the reviewers experienced some lag in mm -hmm. doing so. I mean, and that's on top of a you know two hundred dollars on top of a five hundred dollar PS5 price tag, so that's seven hundred bucks. Now, uh, PC Mag noted that when in, when you compare it to using, say, uh, PS Remote, and like if you have a flagship phone and you use mm -hmm. like a, an aftermarket game controller, it looks better that way than actually playing on the the portal in terms of visual uh, uh, fidelity. Um, and my question is, well, if it's two hundred bucks, and it's really just about not someone hogging your main screen. Couldn't you just use the two hundred bucks, go to Costco and buy a second TV, and then use that for the PS? That's not portable, though. It's true, but this is portable around the house. It, <laughs> yes, you can take it outside, but you know you're not you're not jumping on on your subway ride and then playing that way. Could it be maybe like for dorm rooms where you don't have any TV at all? Uh, well, and that's the thing. It's again. 200 bucks you still need to set up the ps5 so if if you're... yeah if you have a ps5 in the dorm room chances are you've hooked it up to a tv but would if you, you have bothered to? to bring it at all but you're not going to really be able to use it with the portal because the portal can't isn't like a second television right it's just accessing yeah. the games so to set up the ps5 and log in you'd still need that tv i guess that's a, good so, question. That's a weird product yeah it is so and and, and it it, it it, it uh, for me it brings up the question. I I have a feeling it actually probably did a broader range of things, but either because of they needed to meet a price point, uh, and maybe potentially copyright issues, um, they just slimmed it down to this because the hardware inside seems a lot more capable uh, of doing a, a a fair bit more than just being a second screen for a PS5. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't have a lot of storage or anything, but it could access a cloud service given the hardware that yeah. you have. It just doesn't, exactly. but it could. It, yeah, yeah. And I'm wondering maybe down the line, is this something that they give a firmware update to? And in that scenario, this actually becomes a much more compelling product. As it is, if I had a PS5, I would probably spend the 200 bucks on another TV. Or mm -hmm. a used TV because you can get you could get a 4K TV. My dad just bought one for 300 bucks at Costco, and it was like uh -huh. a 46 inch TV. So, you know, the, again, the, if the you're value like, I want to be able to choose good. which room or you know where I'm going to play. You can't pick up the TV and carry it around. That's that's the only that, difference. Otherwise, I got it. That it's, is for true. it's for playing at the dinner table. This, yeah, this is probably geared more for kids who tend to be a little like my kids or with their tablet they literally yeah. orbit the house in five different rooms every day with the tablet yeah. because that's what kids do yeah maybe well folks if you have feedback about anything we get uh to up on the show uh there's lots of ways to get in touch with us uh you can talk to us on x dtns show mastodon we're also dtns show on mstdn.social daily tech news show on tiktok and DTNS Picks, DTNS P-I-X on Instagram and Threads. 
I'm an iconoclast in that I mainly use a very simple text editor for my notes, but most people uh, like themselves more than that <laughs> and so want a more capable note-taking app. Uh, Allison has been searching for the perfect note-taking app, and while she hasn't found the one quite yet, she has a great overview of what note-taking apps are good for which uses. Where should we start? Well, I kept thinking that there was the perfect note-taking app. And I think it's like, have you seen people who are looking for the great getting things done app? The oh, one sure, that yeah. Will, mm -hmm. and, and so instead of getting anything done, they just keep testing new note new apps for that. Well, it's sort of in the same category, but I've realized over time that maybe the right answer is the right app for the right type of note. And this, of course, creates the worst problem, which is I have no idea where any of my notes are. So I'm not actually saying this is good advice. But what I start realizing <laughs> is that you I just I, need a, a, a getting things done app to tell you where all your note taking apps. Wait, are. What about then, I could do an Airtable database that tells me go. where each yeah. app, each yeah. note is. Easy. Well, so the first thing I do is Apple Notes seems like the obvious thing because I'm an Apple person, right? I've sure. got it on all of my devices. Um, so but I, I tend to use it for stuff I don't care about. I've got a couple of notes in there that have been going long playing, but in general, it's like, I just need to write something down. I just, you know, I'm, I'm going to do a grocery order for three things when we're out on a vacation. I'll just slap it in there. Um, so it's the, my throwaway notes are actually in Apple notes because I don't find the organization very good. Um, collaboration's terrible. There's a way to do it, but like, depending on how you send the link, it gets to them or it doesn't. It, I, I don't, I don't think it's a good app at all. I know people love it, but I don't. Yeah, so, I, th I find it interferes too much. I, I need yeah. it to be simpler, yeah. And changing fonts, anything you want to yeah. do where you're actually trying to make like bold headings or anything, it's it's a whole lot of clicking and ick. I don't like it. So All right, so you so that one is because it's there. You use yeah. It. What's, which one's next? Uh, one of the things I did a long time ago was I started using something called Keep It from Reinvented Software. And this is an app that allows, it's, think of it as an Evernote clone. This is where I put stuff I actually have to remember. For example, remembering all of the different things I have to do to be on Cord Killers. That note is stored in Keep It because I'm going to need to go back to that and modify it each time you guys change everything. So th that's my, uh, you know, I put programming notes in there. I put, put things I'm trying to remember on my blog of, of how I've set up my database or something like that. That's long-term storage. Important stuff goes in there that I'm going to need to get back to. Okay, that would make sense different. to me. Yeah, that's a like, oh, how do I do this thing? Uh, yeah. Keep It Keep It has it. Uh, you could put a list of all your note-taking apps in Keep It. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. All right. Magic what decoder next? ring. Yeah, yeah. Well, if I'm doing something like uh, I do this show called Chit Chat Across the Pond Light, and let's say I'm going to have Tom on, and I'm going to want to write a little outline of what we're going to talk about. Secret secret here is I write the show notes or the, the outline for it with the person I'm going to talk to, and I sound like a brilliant interviewer because I already know what the person wants to answer. So it sounds like I'm just off the fly, off the cuff, thinking of these great questions, but they've already told me what questions. Collaboration in Google X, only way to go. So that's why I do all of those there. Okay. Uh, and then uh, tell me about uh, Notability, because I know you use that one as well. Yeah, Notability is um, a real interesting app to me. The primary place I use it is on my iPad. It works on the iPhone and on the Mac. It's it's a real terrible app on the Mac, but it, you can get to your notes at least. But I use it for some real specific things. Because of the pencil, I find it a really good way to knit and cross-stitch and crochet. So uh. patterns are often difficult. Like um, right now I'm doing a cross-stitch project where it's all the little squares and they got little colors in them. And it's really hard to see. The, the, the one I got was very very small. So I took a photo of it, color corrected it. First time I didn't, and that was terrible. Uh, color corrected it so I could match everything up. And now I can zoom way in and with the pencil, just go dot, 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 dot on the ones that I've already done. And it makes it really easy for me to do a better job keeping track of that. But I also use it to rewrite things like my knitting patterns where the pattern itself is confusing. So I'll write it out or I might copy and paste it into there and type it again and get it organized so that it's easier to read. Um, but the other thing I use it for is when I want to think. So writing, if you hmm. write with a keyboard, it's harder to think because you have to think about uh, how I'm going to format them. I'm going to indent them. I'm going to put a bullet there. Is that going to be an italics or whatever? You, you get yourself wrapped up in that. So I use it for programming a lot. When I'm trying to figure out some code, I'll sit down in a chair away from my computer and I'll handwrite pseudocode and it helps me to think instead of type. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah, it does. So this is, this is for knitting and coding. 
the, yeah. the, the notability <laughs> app. Which might uh, come up later. <laughs> I love that. And then Google Docs for, for collaboration. Mm -hmm. uh, what next? So sometimes I just need to type something or paste some text. I just need it to splat somewhere to hold on to it for a minute. Like maybe I'm going to write the same thing to three different people and I want a place to do it. I use something called Cot Editor, C-O-T Editor. And its main most wonderful thing is when you open it up, it's empty. So you don't have to answer five times. Yes, I want an empty doc. No, a new yes. doc. Yes, an empty doc. No, I don't want a template. I just give me a piece of paper. And so uh, it's a little bit easier than text edit built into the Mac, but I occasionally throw that one in there too. But it's it's just real easy to slap in some text. It is a text editor, so I look at it for some coding stuff too, but mostly it's splat in some text, look at it, see if it's what I want. I use text editor exactly the same way you use cot editor, which is I just, I want all the formatting off. I just want to write something in there without any formatting and then I'll put it wherever I'm going to put it and format it uh, later. So this, oh, this one speaks to me. I'm going to have to check out caught editor. Um, uh, what about, uh, what about your next one? We, we still got time for a few more. Okay. So, um, I write about 5,000 words a week for my blog and I start my rough drafts in bear and Bear is a beautiful little note-taking app for Markdown for the Mac. And uh, actually, it's cross-platform, so it's on the Mac, the iPad, and the iPhone. And its best feature is it supports text expander. So I can write my Markdown notes. I can type very quickly and efficiently because I'm crazy about text expander. I can sit on my iPad uh, sipping my coffee in the morning, or I would move over to one Mac or the other Mac, constantly syncing perfectly. It's fabulous for doing my writing my blog posts. But I need to do a lot of special formatting in the end so it doesn't end there. That's kind of where I where I start my blog post. Then I move over to an app called Mars Edit from uh, Red Sweater Software. Uh, and that's a place that I can easily import images and make my fancy little little figures that I put in and, and uh, format things and put in all the blog-related metadata. And then that's what actually goes up to my blog. So those two kind of go hand in hand, but Mars yeah, yeah. Edit doesn't run on the iPad and doesn't, and so I can't use it there and it drives me crazy. And then you use sticky notes too, <laughs> like the, the virtual sticky notes. I, I don't know, maybe you use the paper ones too, I don't know. Uh, yeah, well, I actually do a couple of those, but yes. And its main use, I would say, is probably when talking to you. I have a sticky note up with all the things I need to remember to say, and I want to be clever quickly and sound like I had this just in the top of my head, but I've actually written it down like my question about the PlayStation 5 uh, ah, uh -huh. and all that. It was, uh, I have it, had it in there when I was on Cord Killers. I had a bunch of little things I wanted to make sure I could say and sound articulate, which uh -huh. I don't always sound if I talk off the fly. Um, also use it for the Clockwise podcast because I got to be able to answer succinctly in two minutes each of the questions. Oh, that's fantastic. Uh, well, we'll have links to all of this in our show notes, uh, dailytechnewshow.com. Uh, and of course, uh, Allison, you you do great tutorials and, and show notes of your own over at podfeet.com. So I know people can go there for some resources as well. Thank you. I wrote up the, in particular, the uh, write with a pencil when you want to think. That's one of yeah. my favorites. Fantastic. All right, let's check out the mailbag. Tim is worried about Amazon possibly, reportedly, considering shifting from an Android-based operating system, which is what Fire OS is now, to a new one supposedly called Vega. Now, according to the report, Amazon would start with the Fire TV, but eventually shift everything to it, including tablets. And that's what really has Tim worried. Tim wrote, Tim wrote a lot, uh, but this is, uh, Tim, I hope you'll forgive me for, you know, c crushing it down to the essentials. Uh, Tim says, my family and I have owned about 20 plus Fire tablets from the first to the latest models. So I have thoughts on Amazon ditching Android. Amazon Fire tablets have two primary uses for a cheap tablet. One, it's relatively easy to sideload Google Play Store onto a Fire tablet and have access to almost all Google and other apps available in the Play Store. Two, the parental controls are excellent for setting up child profiles, limiting internet, game time, even filtering what specific books or videos they have access to from Prime. Uh, so Tim's worried that if he sticks with Fire, he'll lose a bunch of those apps that he uses out of the Google Play Store. Uh, but if he switches to an Android-based tablet, he would lose those great parental controls uh, that he has right now. Uh, I don't know if I can speak to parental controls on non-Amazon Fire tablets. Maybe somebody out there can. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Uh, but 
in hopes for the apps, it might not be as bad as you think. Uh, maybe you don't use quite as many apps from the Google Play Store as you think. Maybe you could get by with a few uh, fewer than you think. If that were the case, the one thing I did see is that supposedly Vega is using React uh, which is the same thing that Android and iOS use to make it easy for developers to create cross-platform versions of their apps. Uh, it is kind of one of the ways that smart TV operating systems survive. Uh, the fact that you have any apps on a smart TV uh, is probably down to React uh, because it's mm. it's easy to take those apps that you've developed for another platform. Or it's easier, I should say, uh, to move them over there. So I do not abandon all hope yet, Tim. Maybe it won't be as bad as you think. That does sound a little bit dicey, though, if, I mean, the, the Android tablet market is so small as it is, and then if one of the main ones is cheap Fire tablets and then Fires are no longer on Android, are people going to work to write a cross-platform app in React to get it to go across to those? Well, yeah, that's that's a great question because most people don't realize when they're using an Amazon Fire TV or, 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 or anything, an Amazon Fire a tablet, that they're using Android. Most people mm. don't know they can sideload Google Play on there. Oh. Uh, so when it switches, that switch is going to have to be seamless, right? It's going to have to keep all the apps that they already have. Uh, and I'm not quite sure how they're going to do that dance. Um, and yeah. they seem confident that they can get the developers to do it. So maybe they have an easy way to do it. I don't know. I'm not thinking people who buy $60 tablets are the big money makers in buying apps either. Yeah, not in buying apps, um, in buying right. services, right? So what oh, Amazon sorry. needs okay, to do it. is make sure that they keep those $60 Fire Tablet users subscribed to Prime. Yes, that's <laughs> yeah. that's the ticket. Yep. Yeah, you're right. And you're the right. kids' that's service and uh, yeah, all of that. Uh, well, thank you, Allison, uh, for, for being here. This is great, as always. Uh, if people want more of what you've got going on, where should they go? Well, podfeed.com, of course, is the best place to go. But I want to draw your attention to Chit Chat Across the Pond, number 777. I interviewed a woman named Angela Preston, who has done the coolest thing. She created an open source knitting font using an open source tool called Fontstruct and then built a Google site. Now, this is a, a weird thing, but it's a way to translate text-based uh, patterns for knitting into diagrams that make it easier to follow what you're trying to do in the pattern. It is it is the greatest crossover of knitting and nerdery that I've ever seen. There's probably three people. It's like me and Zoe and Angela, maybe, who all care about this, but it's really <laughs> cool. Um, it, it's it was a really fun interview, and she's she's great. And because we got together, she's a PC user. I was able to help her figure out how people can install this on a Mac because she didn't know how to do it. And so now we've got an even better collaboration going. It was really really fun. Sir ATW says I'm right there too. So yeah, the All right. uh, the group may be bigger than you thought. Who knows? All right, there there you go. Gotta love it. Excellent. Folks, go check that out, podfeet.com. Patrons, stick around for the extended show. We're not done yet if you're supporting us directly. Uh, Allison sent me a picture of someone charging their fish. That it's exactly me. what it sounds like. Uh, and wondered what things that are perfectly normal to say now would have sounded extremely odd in the past. Like, I got to charge my book before our trip. Uh, so we're going to talk to Allison about why she was charging a fish and, uh, and, and what other weird things that we take for granted now. You can also catch the show live Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. Eastern, 2100 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow talking about Android adoption among teens with Will Saddleberg. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>